Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alex Paul from InvestorStream, and I'll be your host today. Presenting for you is AXP Energy CEO, Tim Hart, non-executive director, Sam Jarvis, and newly appointed CFO, Brad Mervis, who will be discussing the company's 2023 reserves and resources and recent financial results and uh, other operational updates. There will be a short presentation on this progress, and Sam, Tim, and Brad will be on hand to address any questions following the presentation. You can download a copy of the presentation by navigating to the handouts pane in the control panel. A copy of the webinar will also be available on AXP's website and social media platforms later today. But without further ado, I'd like to throw it over to Sam to kick things off for us. Sam, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Alex. If you could just uh, flick to the disclaimer slide. Thanks, and leave it on the disclaimer slide for the, set for the moment. Um, thanks everybody for joining us today. Before starting, we would like, as always, to draw your attention to the disclaimer you see on the screen right now. And we would like to highlight some important changes here, specifically that this presentation contains certain non-IFRS measures, being EBITDAX, which is a measure of our ability to generate cash, EBIT, and underlying profit. The Underlying profit is a measure which excludes the impact of acquisitions, disposals, impairments and other items in order to demonstrate the financial performance of the company's core business undertakings. And whilst the non-IFRS measures used in the presentation here are not audited, the figures used for their calculation, reconciliation and presentation have been extracted from the company's audited financial statements. And with that, I'll firstly talk about our financial performance in FY22 in comparison with FY21 with some key highlights. We'll give a high level of our impact and then I'd like to touch on the company's underlying profit. And then Tim will talk about our updated R&R &R assessment and operations generally. So our gross production and net unit sales were both up over 200% for the year. This is a result of us having the Appalachian Basin or MHP asset on the books for the full 12 months. And we officially closed the trade acquisition late last year. So seven months of that asset was included. We produced a net just over 2,000 BCF of gas, around 77,000 barrels of oil, and 5.6 million US gallons of NGLs. Realized pricing for all of these products increased markedly across the period and we achieved an average realised price of just over 37 per BOE uh, versus around 25 that we achieved in FY21. Cash generated from operate, operating activities was solid at 3.2 million versus uh, a 590k burn last year, the last financial year. And historically, going back many years, we've always burned cash. So this is a very important turnaround for the company. Uh, and as a result, we ended the year with a strong cash balance and we still have very little debt to speak of. If we could have the next slide, please, Alex. This is a snapshot of FY22 versus 21 from the top to the bottom line. Starting at the top, sales revenue for the period was five times what it was in FY21. That's again down to having a full year of the Appalachian Basin asset and seven months of the Trey asset and obviously higher realised pricing from high energy prices contributed there substantially also. As would be expected with those new inclusions, operating expenses were substantially higher and it will probably be noted the, that the increase in OPEX was proportionately higher than the increase in gross production and net unit sales. G&A was also up for the same reasons, but we didn't Fortunately, see such a proportionate increase there as we saw for OPEX. So we had fairly strong EBITDAX for the year of 3.3 million and then netting off the major non-cash items and finance and adding back a tax benefit. And despite the significant cost increases, we still managed to end the year with 607,000 in NPAT. This does not compare favourably with FY21 on paper, but I'll talk about that a bit more in the next slide, which I, if I could have that, Alex, please. 
So in FY21, you'll recall that we booked a $6.2 million discount on acquisition, which reflects the difference between the fair value of the MHP asset that we acquired versus what we actually paid for it. This then contributed substantially to our accounting profit for that year of just over $4 million. But we obviously wouldn't claim, and in fact, in our FY21 financial statements, we specifically noted the fact that this $6.2 million non-cash item was a key contributor to the group's profit. So we wouldn't claim that the $4.4 million profit was a correct reflection of the company's underlying performance for the year, obviously, because that $6.2 million skewed the result up. So if we then remove that amount from FY21 and remove some other non-cash items related, which are not related to our operational performance, and we perform the same exercise for FY22, you can see from the table on the left that we have a reconciliation of NPAT to underlying NPAT. And from that, you can see that our underlying NPAT for FY21 was really a 2.1 million loss versus a 589k operate underlying profit for FY21. So in effect, what we can say is that across the periods, we've actually had a positive 2.1, 2.7 million swing from an underlying loss to an underlying profit. And that we believe is a more accurate demonstration of the company's underlying business performance. And that's the financial summary for today. And I'll, I'll now hand over to Tim. Thank you, Sam. Um, so <clears throat> our, our 2022 reserves have increased. Um, that can be seen from the slide that you have in front of you now. And, and, and I, I did expect this. Uh, and I also expect more good news in the future as we further understand the assets uh, and continue to uh, work and mature our field development plan. Um, the last reserves report was completed back in October, so we're only looking at uh, nine months worth of effort. Um, and the highlights really are here uh, in this particular slide. The, uh, the majority of AXP's proved reserves are in the producing and developed category, so we're monetizing them today, um, which is good. There was a 14% increase in 2P as a result of work that we've done or that we've been doing on our field development plan and, uh, and, and, and quite frankly, work on that field development plan continues uh, and we have a tremendous amount of runway here to further develop those, uh, those reserves as, as that field development plan continues to, uh, uh, continues to mature. Slide seven, please, Alex. So this slide speaks to our contingent resources. And uh, as you can see, it's nearly 212 million barrels of oil equivalent in the 2C category uh, that are currently defined. And so that's a pretty sizable number. Uh, to be clear, contingent resources haven't really been a focus since the last reserves report. Our focus has primarily been on our reserves, developing our, our project queue and, and also developing solutions to some pretty complex issues to improve our margins. And one of the things that I do want to point out here is that we have a, a dominant position in the Appalachian Basin. And, and this basin is one of the largest onshore U.S. gas basins. So, you know, if you look at the asset we have, it's a very solid producer with lots of potential for development. Uh, it's a very friendly oil and gas environment. It's got stable long-term sales channels. And, and really in oil and gas, this is, uh, this is about as blue chip as it gets. So, um, uh, so I'm, I'm expecting uh, good things to, to continue to materialize as we, uh, as we get more into this asset. Slide eight, please. So I mentioned in the last slide that we've been focused on some complex issues and, and I'll provide some color on that here. Um, as you're aware, uh, we've been consolidating our assets together into one company, AXP Energy. And so uh, a primary focus of this consolidation was to bring together the financial functions underneath of one roof. 
And in the process of doing this, uh, we've sourced and hired a number of very competent finance professionals to build out our finance team. Um, uh, Brad Mervis, uh, Brad's got 25 years in various senior leadership roles in corporate finance with most of that experience in energy companies. And you may have seen recently that Brad was promoted to our CFO. And I'd like to congratulate Brad on a well-deserved promotion. He's been extremely instrumental in bringing uh, a maturity to our finance team. Stephen Lantner is another person on our finance team. He's the VP of finance. Uh, he's got over 20 years of experience in leadership roles in various oil and gas companies. And Stephen participated in the growth of diversified energy uh, as he worked to build Alliance Petroleum Corporation from a small operator in a 100 to a, into a $100 million company that was later acquired by DGO. And so he's already been through exactly what we're doing uh, here with AXP. And he's also led the effort to select and implement our new financial system, which went live just a few months back. Recently hired a, a gentleman named Scott McConnell. Scott is our controller, and he, he's, as I said, he's our most recent hire with over 25 years of experience in corporate finance and auditing. Uh, Scott served in various leadership roles, including five years as CFO in two different leading healthcare companies in the state of Kentucky in the U.S. And so we feel very fortunate to have Scott on the team as well. And, and my point uh, in this is, is to let everybody know that we have some real depth on our finance team. And, and this was a critical component to moving our company forward. From an operations standpoint, uh, we already have a tremendous amount of expertise within the organization led by Artie Hamilton, our vice president and general manager that heads up the AXP operations team. However, anytime you consolidate assets like we have, there's a lot of work to build out your processes and procedures to cover everything. And uh, we had to set up a new operations division and redefine roles, et cetera, and it's, it's, uh, it's a fairly significant effort. Um, our focus now is on engineering maturity, and there's a lot of work to be done to realize the full potential of this asset and bringing additional engineering resources to bear will help us do that quicker. Um, under bullet point two, we, uh, we continue to identify and bring online additional wells, and the majority of these have been outside of the AMI. Um, and I don't expect this to last forever as we work through and understand each well in the asset. However, uh, we have continued to bring on wells as we find sections of pipeline that require repairs, et cetera. And, and a lot of this work has been in the KJ field as, as it was one of the fields that was neglected uh, the most historically. Um, we're still working on the best solution for gas in the Illinois Basin. And this would include the DPI 2604 and 2605 wells, which you've heard us talk a little bit about. And uh, the uh, existing sales channel there is currently only at an 8% sales margin, uh, which is not all that attractive. And so we've identified a few solutions that are more suitable for that. Uh, and, and we're working on progressing those, uh, those solutions. The, the next two bullet points, uh, three and four, uh, are, in my estimation, the most critical elements of, of what we've been working on since the beginning of the year. And, and these two bullet points speak to our margins and profitability. And if there's one thing that we can do to dramatically improve our situation, it's to solve a few very complex issues that are preventing us from realizing these improved margins. And for those of you who have been supporters of our company for the last year, you're aware that we've been struggling with the reliability of our primary sales channel. And Alex, may I ask you to revert back to slide seven so we can have a quick look at that map? Thank you. Um, so just a bit of a refresher here. This, this map represents our Appalachian Basin assets. And, uh, and, uh, and, and we, we've published this before, but uh, just as a recap, the red dotted line encompasses all of the fields in orange. And a reminder that we are contractually obligated to sell all of the gas associated with the wells inside of this area into one particular sales channel. And as you can see, it's a pretty big area and it includes a large majority of our wells. So it's very significant. Back to slide eight, please, Alex. So with that image in mind, um, this, this primary sales channel for the last half of our fiscal 2022 was largely unreliable. And we've worked very hard to improve this situation with our midstream partner who's responsible for this sales channel. 
And we've had our own experts provide root cause analysis on these outages and have worked collaboratively with their senior management and operations teams. And I believe that we're moving in the right direction. They've invested a lot of time and a lot of money into making changes and improvements in the delivery systems. And over the last several months, we've seen a remarkable improvement in this reliability. However, the key will be what happens throughout the colder months in the winter time. So, uh, so we aren't out of the woods just yet. And due to the fact that this reliability is beyond our control, uh, we've been working on a solution that will mitigate this reliability deficiency if the improvements made by our midstream partner aren't quite as effective as, as uh, have been intended. And, and we'll be talking more about this solution in the near future. And, and one other uh, significant issue that has impacted our margins is related to uh, NGLs. Our liquids production is in excess of about 20,000 gallons per day. And, and let me give you a little background on this for reference. AXP produces a heavy gas. And in most cases, heavy gas is good because it results in two different commodities that you can sell, NGLs and dry gas. However, the, the processing required to separate these, these two commodities adds some complexity. And in our case, we send the gas through a cryogenic processing plant, which is owned and operated by our midstream partner. And once separated, the gas is delivered into the East Tennessee Natural Gas Pipeline, uh, and many people refer to that as Transcozone 5. These liquids get stripped out of the gas stream, moved to a liquids terminal, and loaded onto a truck or a rail car so they can be transported to the sales point. And the issue that we have is that neither the plant or the liquids buyer has had a solution in place for elevated ethane content in the gas. And so we've been in a position where we've had to buy materials to blend with our liquids in order to safely transport them inside of the transport vessels. And the material is extremely expensive. The process is very cumbersome and the solution is unacceptable. And so collectively, and, and when I say collectively, I mean the owners of the plant, the buyer of our liquids, and every producer that sells gas through that midstream asset. Uh, we, we've all been focused on coming up with a solution to this problem. And, and we've been working on this diligently for the last uh, four or five months. And, and it's been a bit of a trial and error exercise. We, being AXP, solved the issue for 30% of our liquids volumes back in September. Um, and the owners of the plant and our NGL buyer have been developing a holistic solution that should significantly reduce the blending requirement for all producers. Uh, but to ensure that we have near-term success uh, with this very impactful issue, AXP is also working on a, a tertiary option uh, for, our, uh, for the 70% of our uh, liquids. And so the takeaway here is that these issues are very complex. They take time to solve. And in some cases, they not only include complex engineering and process improvements, but they also include contract negotiations. And more importantly, the issues that we're solving are maturing the infrastructure of the sales points, and it'll be very impactful throughout the life of our assets. In short, we're solving some core problems here, and, and the solutions to these resolutions are going to have a meaningful impact on the economics of the asset. And if you consider the assets that AXP has assembled, the production is there. Uh, production is typically the most difficult thing to get. Um, our top line is strong, and, and we've been working very hard to improve our bottom line results, and the solutions that we're implementing are designed to do just that. And, uh, and we're looking forward to sharing more about our progress uh, in the near term. And the last bullet point, um, uh, developing our reserves, uh, significant focus uh, has been on our field development plan, and, and we have 32 projects that are very well defined and prioritized. Uh, these projects are all outside of the AMI currently, uh, but they roll up into a list of over 300 projects that are in development. So, so the project deck is very strong, and it's growing daily. Um, and, and with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Alex, for the Q&A portion. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> Great presentation. Now, we'd we'll like to introduce Brad Mervis, the newly appointed CFO, uh, to answer the, uh, a couple of questions uh, from the outset. Brad, uh, welcome to the webinar. Um, 
I think the, the first question I'd like to address to you, if I can, is uh, why was there such a dis disproportionately high increase in OPEX, you said a 290% increase, versus only a 214% increase in gross unit production? Hi, Alex. Thanks for the question and welcome all to the webinar. Um, our operating costs of uh, 2210 um, per BOE, $22.10 per BOE, was 22% higher than our FY22 operating cost per BOE. And this is mainly as a result of the inclusion of the cost of blending, the blending the NGLs. And this is, was around $3.30 per BOE. As Tim has just alluded to, the operations team has been working to identify a solution which significantly reduces or eliminates the blending process from the cost structure. And the solution was a solution was implemented in late August to reduce the blending method for approximately a third of our produced liquids. And um, as Tim has further alluded to, in turn, Multiple solutions are now in the process of being developed to reduce or eliminate the blending requirements on the remaining two-thirds of the liquids. So we should see going forward a reduction in uh, in our cost per, per BOE. Thanks, Brad. Now, uh, I understand that um, talk about bringing the finance function in-house has been uh, quite prevalent for some time. Has that been completed now? How much was the company spending on it? And what will the company save by bringing the finance function in-house? Um, Tim, uh, sorry, Alex. The, um, the accounting department cost around $1.4 million in financial year in 2022. However, 40% of this amount, around, around $800,000 US dollars, is related to outsourced accounting services that supported the expansion of the asset base. So during the second half of the financial year, the management team successfully upgraded the group's financial systems. We hired additional staff, as Tim uh, mentioned earlier, to streamline the accounting process and operations and bring it in-house. And as a result of this, the group's finance functions, except for the DJ Basin assets, which is expected to be completed shortly, are now being managed out of the corporate head office in Lexington, Kentucky. Once all the finance functions are brought in-house, we forecast to cut around a third of the accounting department costs. Thanks, Brad. Now I'd like to turn to Tim for the next question, if I can. Tim, how much additional gas are you now delivering with the midstream improvements that you've made so far? Oh, Alex, uh, this question is a bit more difficult to answer than you might think for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that the improvements uh, that have been made are relatively recent, and so um, uh, so quantifying those uh, is a little premature. Real the the um, reliability. Uh, is and always has been better in the warmer months of the year. And and so, you know, if you look back on the last few months, they've all been pretty warm. So I wasn't expecting to uh, to really have any um, uh, significant degradations in service uh, during that time. So, so we really need a larger sample size than we have right now in order to provide uh, some some meaningful data here. Um, I, I would suggest that we'll need to get through the winter before we can uh, before we can really quantify uh, what that looks like. So do you have any additional on-location gas sales deals that will close within the next quarter? I, I can tell you that we're working on several deals and are hoping to close at least one of them within the next quarter. Um, I am I'm hesitant to disclose much more uh, due to the sensitivities attached to the negotiations, but uh, but we certainly are looking at New gas sales deals, and uh, and and uh, I believe that uh, at least one of them will close within the next quarter. So, Tim, if profits are up, can you hire more staff to get more wells online and producing? You know, as as I discussed during the presentation, we're we're looking to improve our our engineering depth uh, within the organization. Um, we've, we've made great strides on the finance team and the ops teams already. 
Um, and uh, and so it's time for uh, it's time to to provide some focus on engineering. I think that's going to help us uh, further understand the field, further help develop the field development plan, uh, which will feed into uh, you know more clarity on uh, what the uh, reserves and and resources look like long term. So, Tim, we've heard you talk about margin improvement and fixing blending for a couple of quarters now, but we're yet to see evidence of these improving. Are there underlying issues that you can't fix? No, not at all. Um, it, it's really just a matter of time and sensible negotiation. Um, a, as I mentioned, we've established a good relationship with our midstream partner, and and it wasn't always good, um, uh, but we're working collaboratively, collaboratively with them um, and, you know, these are some complex solutions uh, to, to game-changing deliverables, and they take time and patience. Um, we're very close here, and, and I'm looking forward to reporting on the progress, so stick with us. So, Tim, how do you plan to promote the progress on Elite EMUs and oil and gas being unlocked in Colorado? Well, um, we're very pleased with the progress Elite has made, and, and I anticipated us providing a fuller update on this uh, in the next week or two. Um, Elite have bigger plans for Colorado, and, and now that we've done all the hard work with respect to permitting and complying with other regulatory requirements, uh, expansion becomes a lot easier. And, and just to be clear, uh, for EXP, our role is limited to providing the gas, uh, which is our core business. Um, we have uh, developed a very good relationship um, with Elite, and and for those who follow the crypto mining space, uh, you'll you'll know that uh, you know the the uh, the market has been uh, uh, not so kind to crypto uh, as of late, and um, Elite is still providing their services. They're still expanding. Um, and their uh, philosophy is that this is when you grow. Uh, and, and so um, the progress that we've made in Colorado, all, although it's, it's not been on the timetables that we've hoped, uh, there's been a lot of groundwork that we've laid and, and we're gonna leverage that uh, to the fullest potential uh, as we move forward. Now that one of EMI's portable units are up and running, is there oil actually flowing in Colorado or do you need at least two units up and running for the oil to flow? Well, we've always produced oil in Colorado, um, but you are correct, this will help us produce more. The EMUs are being powered by our biggest wells in the field, Pathfinder 2 and Amerigo Vespucci, and, and as we bring up gas supply, the rate of oil production uh, will increase too, but we'll update more on this in the next few weeks. Based on the information on the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission website, it looks like Pathfinder 2 only produced sporadically in the winter months of 2018 and 2019. Tim, can you talk about why Pathfinder 2 was cho chosen as the primary supply for EMI when AV seems like the, the far superior well and, uh, and can we expect it to run without issue for the most part? Well, to be clear, um, uh, we are intending to power uh, or to supply gas from uh, from Pathfinder, Amerigo Vespucci, and JW Pal. Um, the uh, the Pathfinder site was um, uh, was more suitable uh, was a more suitable location due to its proximity, uh, due to the site layout, uh, and and so uh, you know we put the mining operation on the Pathfinder site, but we have plumbed in uh, the Amerigo Vespucci well. Uh, the the um, uh, the gathering line has been ran. It's not uh, connected up yet, uh, but in time we'll also be bringing JW Pal over as well. So um, so uh, you know as we uh, continue to supply gas to that site, I anticipate that all three of those wells will be coming online. Uh, Pathfinder first, uh, and then Amerigo Vespucci and JW Pal at some point in the future. So, Tim, the original heads of agreement with EMI was for three years running through to August 2024. Will that be amended to 2025 due to the delays? Um, so the HOA is, is an overriding agreement, and each individual site has its own uh, gas purchase agreement. And so, um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, 
uh, the uh, the HOA will continue to govern those sites, um, but uh, but they're more well defined in that gas, gas purchase agreement. So the May 13th press release indicated the major customers' contracted gas take will drop from 500 decatherms uh, per day to 3,000 from November through to March. Will the 2,000 uh, decatherms be sold on the open market closer to the spot price? Yeah, and and let me provide some uh, some insight into our philosophy on this. Um, selling into the Transco Zone 5 market uh, is always more attractive in the winter. Um, and, and so my philosophy in locking in gas prices is to lock in a certain amount so that we can insure ourselves uh, against uh, the downside um, and make sure that, uh, that we're healthy uh, with just our minimum volumes locked in. Um, and, uh, and, and in the winter, uh, we reduce that uh, more because we know we're going to be getting better pricing. And, and you'll see that trend continue um, throughout, uh, throughout our history with, uh, with the asset. So, uh, we, you know, we, we locked in 5,000 um, to, uh, to leverage uh, what I thought was, uh, was pretty attractive pricing for that time frame. Um, and we dropped it to 3,000 during the cold months so that we can sell the other 2,000 on spot uh, at a higher price. Okay, Tim, so we'll just shift off the operational stuff for a second here. Um, has there been any thought of listing on other exchanges such as the London Stock Exchange? Well, right now, we're we're focused on the ASX, and, and of course, um, when our shares trade above a penny on the OTC uh, for more than 30 days, the uplisting on OTC is a priority for us. Uh, we like this market very much. Um, uh, currently, you know that's where our focus is, and and, uh, uh, and and the OTC will be the next uh, uh, the next focus for us. And so what are your plans to promote the company in the United States? I mean, how much company presence is there to promote in country? So we're, we're planning a more active program of shareholder engagement, and, and it's all about doing this at the right time. And as I've said, we're working on some major fixes in the business, which have been extremely complex, uh, and we're close to finalizing these things. And after this, uh, that's really the time to to sell our investment uh, attractions more proactively, and and what I will say is is good promotion is underpinned by solid operational delivery. Thanks, Tim. A, a couple more, and we've um, over the course of the the prepare, preparing for the webinar, we had a lot of questions about this next one. I'm sure you've got the same. When will the company deal with the share structure? Yeah, we do get a lot of questions about this, Alex. And um, a, a reverse split or a, or a share consolidation is just not on our radar right now. Um, there's a right time to pursue these types of things, and now is just not that time where our share price, with our share price where it is now. Um, we're looking at other ways to improve the register, which uh, which we'll be communicating shortly. Thanks, Tim. And final question, in your view, are there any barriers from investors in the US getting involved in the ASX shares? Could the trading fees, uh, I understand it's about $44 a foreign security fee plus $6.95, could those trading fees be preventing people from the, from the United States from entering the ASX? Yeah, so, so one thing that, um, that we can do and that, uh, and that we are uh, pursuing is to get what's called uh, DTC eligibility, um, which uh, allows U.S. investors the opportunity to buy and sell more cost effectively. And and we're just determining if we can do this with our current OTC status. Um, we're, we're committed to finding ways to make the company more accessible to U.S. investors through OTC, uh, as we've said. Thanks, Tim. Well, look, that's all the time we have today. Uh, thank you all for joining me. And I'd also like to thank uh, Sam, Tim uh, for presenting and uh, Tim and Brad for taking the time to answer some questions.
As mentioned before, a recording of the webinar will be on AXP's website and social media platforms later today. Tim, before I let you go, uh, do you have any final comments to leave with us today? I do. Thanks, Alex. And uh, and thanks for all of our investors that uh, took the time to, to join us on the webinar today. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank all of you, our loyal shareholders, for their confidence in our efforts to build this great company. Um, I'd also like to thank the hardworking people of AXP who tirelessly look for new solutions and solve problems daily. Um, I, you know, I, I sincerely wish that you all had the opportunity to know who they are because it would give you a whole new level of confidence that your investment's in very good hands. And, and we look forward to updating the market as, as more developments occur. Fantastic. Well, that wraps it up for us here. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day and all the best. Thank you, Alex.